In this video, I'm covering how to resolve dog aggression between two or more dogs living in the same home. I'm gonna be covering principles that you can implement in the household right away for results, and I'm also going to give you an actionable technique that you can do over an extended period of time to improve the relationship between your dogs. So if you're looking to improve that relationship, prevent aggression in the future, I do recommend you go and save this video to your library so that you can reference it again in the future. Let's get into it. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to enhance your dog's mental health. On this channel, we break down scientific research in order to inform us on how to train dogs. If you enjoy taking a nerdier approach to dog training, consider subscribing. In my signature program, the Recovering Rover program, I work with guardians of dogs facing anxiety and aggression. It is very common for teams to join the RP if they have dogs facing inner household aggression. Inner household aggression can look a couple of different ways, but commonly it is over some sort of resource or space. And so what that means is, one dog might walk into the other room and dog A is gonna attack, or dog B approaches dog A's food bowl and dog A attacks. Or perhaps one dog approaches the guardian and the other dog attacks. Generally, there's a context that it commonly happens. What can happen is that over a period of time, we see these incidents become more and more frequent and they become generalized. So they start happening in more and more contexts. While you might think that there's just one dog that is the main aggressor and that's the dog that needs training, the truth is that both dogs need a recovery. So for example, I'm gonna use Lola and Mater who are currently in the RRP. And while Lola may have been the technical aggressor against Mater, Mater had experienced that trauma so often that Mater now distrusts Lola and Mater would demonstrate that fearful, sensitive behavior. And there was just more stress in the space combined. We we need to recover both dogs' perspectives of each other. We need to foster a better relationship on both ends. And so while you may think that it's just one dog that's the problem and that's the dog that needs training, if you focus all of your training and all of your effort on only dog A who's aggressing, you won't get very far because we also need to recover dog B's trauma. And I use trauma intentionally. I'm not throwing that around loosely. Imagine if you were living in a home where you were consistently attacked. Maybe you're not necessarily injured every single time, but you are aggressed towards so frequently that you now have a negative association with this person or with this individual. And that is what happens when you have a dog that has been aggressed towards. Of course, both dogs can be demonstrating aggression. You may even see it where one dog is the primary aggressor and one dog demonstrates aggression more frequently. However, their aggression is less injurious in nature. And once you get the other dog actually involved and that other dog is demonstrating aggression, their behavior is far more dangerous overall. So we need to be treating both dogs holistically. Something to assess very early on in your recovery is how often are both dogs on. And what I mean by on is how often do they feel alert? Do, how often in their day-to-day -day life do they feel like they need to scan or be sensitive? They walk into rooms trepidatiously. How often do they seem more sensitive in nature? If you're noticing that overall your dog's either one or both of them are always on guard, this really means that we need to separate the dogs and give them some opportunity to return back to homeostasis. I know that some trainers ask you to separate the dogs merely out of safety precautions, and then there are other trainers that say you shouldn't be separating the dogs at all because that's going to make it worse when they get back together. I think that the latter argument where two dogs can get back together and that's actually worse for them that they've taken that break, we do see that in some cases, and I don't wanna discredit that. However, that more tells me, if we put the two dogs back together and there's more aggression, what that tells me is that we're not actually treating the root issue. And so it's not so much that we separated them that that's the problem, so much as it is we've misdiagnosed the problem altogether, which I'm going to get back to in a second. The reason I recommend you separate the dogs for however long, and I'll tell you how long in a moment, the reason I recommend you separate them is because we need to give their bodies an opportunity to come back to homeostasis as much as possible. When they are always on guard, 
they are producing more adrenaline, they are producing more cortisol, they are producing more stress and resources are being expended that are not conducive for healthy learning. Our goal in separating them is focusing on enrichment, on individual enrichment, so that we can get both of their cognitive states to a better uh, capacity for learning and growth. When you're separating them, it's not so much out of safety precautions, which sometimes it is, I, I'm not saying don't do it for safety precautions, but it's not so much for that as much as it is we need to be focusing on their enrichment and their mental health in that stage. Now, when you're in this bubble, of keeping the two dogs separated. You're actually doing some homework in the meantime. The first thing you wanna analyze is what are the contexts under which the aggression is most likely to occur? Perhaps it is only happening in specific contexts, say around mealtime, or it's only happening when mom walks into a room, or it's only happening on the couch, or it's only happening when the two dogs are getting back together for the first time. You know, maybe they were playing outside and then they ran inside and now they're in that combusted energy all indoors. You want to be very intentional about what are the contexts and the situations that I'm seeing this aggression occur most often. Perhaps it's even like in the case of Groot and Naya, where Groot would aggress towards Naya when he was over aroused. And so they would start playing, 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 and then his adrenaline would kick in and he would end up aggressing. And this made Naya very sensitive to play around him and was much more hesitant to do so. You want to think about what are the contexts that this aggression is occurring. Then you also want to do the flip side of that. What are the contexts that this aggression is not occurring? Which is to say that the two dogs are able to do an activity and things are reasonably harmonious, right? You see that they're not checking over their shoulder, they're not nervous about the situation, they are living pretty peacefully. If your dogs are 100% separated right now and you're watching this video and you're like, dude, they can't do anything together at all. First of all, that doesn't mean you're a bad guardian. That's perfectly reasonable, it's perfectly normal, it's okay. And what you wanna think about instead is, when times were good, when the two were together, what were the things that they used to love doing together? Is there any activity or activities that they did that was very enriching for both of them that, that did not end up ultimately in an aggressive state? Those are the activities you wanna be listing. Now, it could be as simple, guys, as they just enjoy sleeping next to each other. That is an enrichment process. That is something that you can optimize later on. So don't necessarily think about it as in simple terms of like, well, they like playing ball. That's one way of thinking of it, but it could be just as simple as, we all liked sitting in the living room watching TV. That was our thing. That was what was peaceful. Something as commonplace and minute as that is definitely an enrichment activity to write down on your list. Now, once you do put the dogs together, you're going to put them in situations where they are most likely to experience that enrichment activity again, okay? And now, I have a full video on what exactly enrichment is, and so if you're looking to dig deeper into how to optimize enrichment just for an individual dog or for both of the dogs, that video is definitely helpful for you, and I'll link it in the description box as well. But you wanna think about what is a scenario that you can set up intentionally to make it as enriching and most likely to be successful as possible. These are the moments you want to start prioritizing. I don't actually recommend you jump right into a training protocol, which I'm gonna to get to in a moment. I'm gonna to get to a training technique in a moment. I don't actually recommend you jump right into that technique if you don't have to. Now, if your dogs are 100% separated right now because every single time they get near each other, it's just World War III, then you are gonna have to jump right into the technique right away, okay? But if there are some cases where you know you can put the two dogs together, it could be you take them out of the house and they're much better and happier if they're outside of the house together. If there are situations where you know they can coexist harmoniously and enriching, then those are the moments you want to start to methodically place. And everything else, they're gonna stay separated for right now, okay? So that the only times that they're coming together is for something that they love doing. We love going for walks with mom. We love sitting and watching TV. We love, you know, running around the house and chasing balls together. That's our vibe. You're gonna set up those moments, whatever they are, and those are the first introductions. Again, we should be having layers of precaution. How many layers of precaution you have and what those layers of precaution are, are highly dependent on your dog's history together and what that aggression actually looks like. But layers of precaution could be 
leashes, they could be muzzles, they could be walls between each other, fences between each other, they could be a range of items. You want to be thinking about what is the safest way to set up this design of this event while still keeping the integrity of the event intact which is to say you're not putting a muzzle on a dog and then asking them to chew a Kong, right? That wouldn't really make sense. Or perhaps you're not asking them to sleep on the same bed, but putting a fence between the two of them. That wouldn't make any sense either. You're kind of distorting the integrity of the bed at that point. So you wanna be thinking of what is the safest way to set up this event without distorting the event and making it unrealistic and unreasonable. Now, for a more formal training technique, once you have the dogs starting to have these enriching experiences together, you need to start moving into a more formal protocol. This is especially true if your dogs are completely separated right now and they're never together, and every single time they get together, it's just like World War III. This protocol is how you're gonna start off. You're gonna start off using processes called counter conditioning and desensitization. And for this, there's a key framework. Step one is to classically condition your dogs to each other. So here's what that means. Right now, when your dogs are near each other, it's instant arousal, right? They are just excitable. It is pandemonium inside. And so perhaps one dog is more fearful. Perhaps one dog is angry. Perhaps one dog is experiencing just hyper arousal overwhelm and that is ensuing panic. Whatever it is right now, they get to each other and that arousal is racing that adrenaline is racing. What we want to do is first tame the amygdala to think that we are not in immediate danger, okay? Which is to say, as soon as they see each other, they need to start anticipating something good is about to happen. So for this, every single time you put them together, you're going to make sure that it is raining high, high, high value reinforcement and is happening to both of them. You can do this with a treat. They see each other, you mark feed. They look at each other, you mark feed. They look at each other, you mark feed. They come together, you yes feed, okay? You are basically syncing up the event of them looking at each other, walking towards each other, being closer together, with something incredible that they both love. Now, you do want to try to feed both dogs as simultaneously as you possibly can. However, if you can't do both simultaneously, because sometimes we're humans, I definitely recommend you choose the dog who is most likely to get aggressive. You feed that dog first, okay? Just because that dog's patience level is usually more limited. So we need to give that dog his information as quickly as possible. So you mark, feed, and then feed the other dog. You mark, you feed, and then you feed the other dog. You wanna be thinking of how can I make sure that these dogs know that the outcome, the high value reinforcer, whether that's a treat or that's a ball or that's a whatever, the outcome is because of that other dog. That is your objective. Step two is to think about what behaviors you want the dogs to do now that they're together. The thing is, is a lot of times I see dogs get stuck in that initial engage where they understand, oh, I look at the person or I look at the dog and I get a treat. I look at them, I get a treat. They pick up that game really fast and then you stay in that stage for too long and they end up getting frustrated because they're like, this isn't realistic. I don't know what I'm supposed to do anymore. I can keep looking and you can keep feeding me, but it doesn't make any sense anymore, right? What is the objective here? And remember that your dogs are asking you clarifying questions throughout the learning process constantly. They are trying to figure out what you want and they are trying to give it to you. If they really didn't want to give it to you, they would just walk away. So they want to deliver. And so it's important that you're telling them now that you are together, now that you know good things are about to happen, here are some behaviors that you can do in the space. Now, notice I said behaviors plural, and I, I do recommend that over the period of your dog's learning, you are showing your dogs that they can do a myriad of behaviors, but you wanna start off with the behaviors that make sense in the context that they are existing. Do not ask your dogs to do behaviors that don't make sense for the context. That's not gonna help you in the long run, okay? Because your dogs will figure out that it doesn't make sense, that it's unrealistic. So here's an example of what I mean. If you are working in the kitchen because you're trying to focus on mealtime, it would not make sense to then bring out a Kong full of peanut butter and ask them to chew on peanut butter if your objective is to set up mealtime. It might make more sense to ask them to go to a corner and sit patiently and wait. On the other hand, 
if the objective is to get them to play in the backyard. It would not make sense to ask them to do a down stay. A down stay is the antithesis of going out and playing. So we want to think about what is the context asking and what behaviors can I ask of my dog to start demonstrating the behavior that makes sense for that context. Sometimes that is going to be an obedient skill. Sometimes it's gonna be as simple as can you touch my palm? Sometimes it's gonna be as simple as can you give me eye contact? Sometimes it is going to be a very simple obedient behavior, but I can't encourage you enough to start using as many organic behaviors as you possibly can. The more you can get the dogs demonstrating their natural interactions and their natural behaviors, like just, why don't you just go to this bed and lay down and chill? You don't need to look at me while you do it. You don't need to be at attention while you're on your place. I just want you to go to this zone and hang out, right? Or why don't you go into this corner of the backyard and have a snafari? Why don't you go sniff, right? You wanna start getting your dog to do things that make it feel like they're just existing. It's not formal. The more you can push a more informal training opportunity, the more sustainable it is. And that leads me into the third step of this framework, which is to maintain the behavior. Now, when you're maintaining the behavior, you're extending out that duration, but you're keeping also the fight, flight, or freeze response within the body at bay. You're asking the body to still continue engaging in this more stimulating event, go sniff, go wait patiently at the, at the table while you wait for the food to come, go hang out in the sunroom and sunbathe. Do this thing without escalating your arousal, with maintaining a whatever homeostasis or whatever arousal makes sense for that context. Some contexts, of course, are going to demand a more arousing experience. As I said before, when we were working with Groot, he was most likely to aggress towards Naya when he was stimulated and when he was playing and when he was roughhousing. And so we really knew that those were the moments we needed to be most focused. And so we built up his arousal and we asked him to maintain it, not bring it right back down. We don't want him going in a roller coaster of energy. That's not realistic. What we're looking for is build and maintain. And so when you think of this, you're thinking, can I get you to redirect? Despite the high arousal, despite the heart rate, despite the fact that you're running around, despite the fact that you're panting, can you still give me eye contact? Can you still pause in the middle of play and check in with your play partner to see if they're engaging well, right? Those are the things we want to be instigating. Now, on the flip side, if you're focusing on getting the dogs to lay comfortably in the same room while you watch TV, you don't need that heart rate racing. You don't need the adrenaline pumping. You don't need things flying. Instead, you you want subtlety, you want calm, you want more relaxed cheekbones, and perhaps they're snoozing, perhaps they're snoring, right? Those are all of the behaviors that you're trying to optimize. When you are in this third phase, when you're in this third phase of the framework where you're trying to maintain the behavior, this is desensitization. And more specifically, it's systematic desensitization. Desensitization is the process of exposing your dogs to one another for an extended period of time where they can ultimately see the outcome that everything is safe, everything is good, everything is right. Notice that both dogs are getting trained throughout this process. Again, both dogs need to be desensitized to one another. We are not looking for indifference. I'm going to say that again. We are not looking for indifference. If you are trying to foster a just do as I say and just deal with it, relationship between the two dogs where they just have to deal with the fact that the other one is there, this is not a sustainable plan. It will fall apart, period. I don't know about you, but most people don't like being in the same household as another individual and just dealing with it. That's not healthy for anyone's mental health. We need to be in environments where we feel safe, where we like the other individuals. That is a much more long-term solution. So our objective in this desensitization process and actually throughout the whole framework is to get them to enjoy being with each other. The objective is to get them having that dopamine kick, having the oxytocin, kicking in that serotonin for one another once again. 
that's what we're trying to achieve because that's a much more long-term solution. Now to do this framework effectively, you will need to become a master at understanding both dogs behavior. And I want to be clear when I talk about understanding your dog's body language, I don't just mean like know the key phrases like is your dog growling or is your dog jumping? Those are such obtuse and quite frankly, unimportant information in the grand scheme of things. Instead, you need to get more minute, which is one of the reasons why in my very next video, I'm going to be breaking down how to read your dog's body language individually to understand what both dogs are saying at each time. So if you're interested in that video, make sure you consider subscribing, hit the notification bell so you get notified when I drop a new video. If you're watching this video well into the future, then I have linked it in the description box and you can check it out now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next week.